No, pain is a lonesome place. I don't have to tell you, do I? It'll drop a rock in your stomach right through your pounding heart. And when your knees are so weak, you hit the ground and you finally realize you don't got this. Well, now you might just make it. You see, the tallest tree may not weather the storm, but its roots do. So dig in, stand up, and let the wind blow. Because there's hope. to start off this series hope in the dark with the uh, first title is where are you god and uh, i don't know if you can remember but years ago in the star trek movies there was a, a test called the kobayashi maru test and uh, it's part of the old movies and the new and, and quite literally it was this it was a, a starfleet set up this test for all the starfleet captains and in this test uh, you were given a scenario that was a no win scenario there was no way to survive it uh, it was an impossible mission. And, and the kind of joke from the Star Trek series is, is Captain Kirk somehow managed to sabotage the test so he was able to win it. Um, he somehow got in the machinery and changed the program that made it possible. Um, it's, this, it's this test where you, you have to rescue these hostages and you're in dangerous territory and, and there's three Klingon um, ships bearing down on you, intent on your destruction and, and all the aspects of it. And somehow Kirk rigged it and, and things like that. But... Um, the question around the Kobayashi Maru in the movie is, is there such thing as a no-win scenario? Is there such thing as a, a problem that cannot be solved? And, uh, you know, that's, that's what happens times like this. You know, like the questions that come with this, you know, COVID-19 um, scenario we're, we're just starting into really in some ways. We don't know where this is heading. But, but questions like, how did God let this happen? You know, I thought we were advanced. I thought we, you know, we kind of solved all this stuff. I thought, you know, plagues were a thing of the past. Why would he let that happen again? They're horrible things. Um, where are you, God? You know, what does God have to say at a time like this? When will it be over? That's probably the biggest question, you know. Everybody is so intent on solving this so we can get back to normal. But will things ever be normal again? That's the question. Like, you know, think about it. What happens next time? Um, <clears throat> what, what, you know, what will normal be? Uh, there, it'll be kind of like after 9-11. I don't know if you can remember 9-11, but I, I just remember, you know, a, a guy from the church, we had just started the church, calling me on the phone and saying, turn on your TV, you're not going to believe what's happening. He said someone, you know, smashed a plane into the buildings. And, I, you know, at first I was like, oh, I wonder what that's about. Anyways, I turned on the TV and then I was just sat there in rapt attention for hours. Uh, my boys were little and, you know, they were kind of playing with their toys and stuff like that. As I watched the plane, you know, first of all, the first one had, had smashed in. And then while I was watching, the second one smacked into the second tower. And I remember someone saying, you know, a few days afterwards saying, Things will never be the same. And they were right. I mean, just the nature of international travel, the problems of the Middle East, the wars that would come from it. Things changed. And sometimes I wonder if this is, is going to be the same. The question for the believer, though, is, is can God be good when life is not? Um, Craig Rochelle writes in uh, his book, A Hope in the Dark, can God be good when life is not? When life hits hard, it plunges us into a sea of questions we hoped we'd never have to ask. But when you feel broken, abandoned, and struggling to find answers, there is a beacon in the storm, a comfort in your pain, a hope in the dark. And so that's quite literally what we want to cover and talk about in this series. And so today we're going to start with the first chapter of the book of Habakkuk. I was kind of a jog in the morning and uh, while I'm out jogging uh, this time of year, especially, you look down uh, just to make sure you're not jogging into something i won't say anything more about that but just just say the spring's a pretty messy time and you want to make sure you know where you're stepping anyways i've seen some interesting things that, and and uh y y this is such an introspective time i mean we're quite literally um 
there's so much going on that every day it's like watching a train wreck. You can't not see the apps or the, the news articles or all the things about what's happening right now. The world is really focused on this one problem at this time. But I saw some things. I, I was looking down one day and there was a full cigarette broken in half. And I thought, what's the story behind that? I wonder, you know, is, is, that, is that some, you know, child has said to his mom, you know, mom, don't smoke. It makes you more susceptible. And the mom, you know, either begrudgingly or you know, knowingly broke it you know, to try to set their kid's heart at ease or, or, or maybe someone's just walking down the road and recognizing that they've got to quit this habit and this is probably the time to do it. You know, there's all kinds of questions to it. You know, someone driving along and their spouse, you know, maybe he's nagging her about it and she finally gets frustrated and breaks it and throws it out the window. I walk by another medical mask lying on the grass, a Lysol wipe, you know, two probably most symbolic things of our time right now. Um, I ran by the play gym where my kids used to play all the time. They're a little big to do that now. And there's caution ribbons all over the play equipment. I thought, wow, this is a different time. Some of the headlines in the newspaper, uh, I'll just read a few. I mean, they each have a story. Seven potential consequences of the coronavirus pandemic. Another headline said, when, the, when will the economy ever bounce back? Um, another one, Spanish and Italian deaths hit new high. Uh, one of the Canadian ones, Canadian hospitals see surge in coronavirus patients with Ontario, Quebec, and Alberta of greatest concern. Another one, interesting, facts before fear, someone trying to assuage the panic that people are going through. I, I just want to say this, and, and this is a bit of a summation of what I'm going to talk about today, is this, is just because you don't understand God doesn't mean you can't trust him. Our lives are filled with things we don't understand, yet we choose to trust. Trust is, you don't do anything without trust. You don't go out your front door without trust. Think about getting on an elevator. How many of us actually know how elevators work? Very few of us. Uh, we don't know about the intricacies of it. A lot of us don't know how dangerous it is if an elevator, you know, drops and the impact it can have for people. I remember as a kid thinking, oh, if that ever happens, I'll just jump right before it crashes. Um, you know, all these kind of things we do. Uh, require trust. And God's the same. We don't always understand why he's doing what he's doing or what he's allowing and why he's allowing it. But we can always trust him. We always can. The book we're uh, focusing on is called the book of Habakkuk. It's a, it's a little book on the hind end of the Old Testament. It's from a group of books called the Minor Prophets. Minor Prophets weren't minor because their stories weren't important or their accounts weren't important. They were minor because they were very small books, often um, three or four chapters at the most in, on average. And uh, probably the most well-known minor prophet was the book of Jonah, uh, the account of Jonah. But there's actually 12 of them, and they have some amazing things to say. They were all really clustered around a time in Israel's history. First of all, when the first kingdom, Israel in the north, um, met its end when the Assyrians came in, and then the south when Judah met its end uh, to the Babylonians. And Habakkuk is uh, one of these prophets, and he wrote this little book, um, and it's at an interesting time. Actually, things are going pretty well in Judah when Habakkuk writes this book. And uh, he writes at first, and he asks God to explain to him, you know, why people are doing such bad things and how God lets them get away for, with it. And he's actually talking about his own people. Um, this book was written around 600 uh, BC, uh, and it, it, as we know from the history, around 586 is when it, uh, Judah would fall as a kingdom. Um, but, you know, he's perplexed about this, so he expresses this to God. And, uh, you know, he, 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 his first complaint is, you know, how long, Lord, must I call for help? It says in verse 2, but you do not listen or cry out to you violence, but you do not save. Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you make me, why do you tolerate wrongdoing? He said, God, why are you letting us get away with this? Why are our people getting away with this? Now, the name Habakkuk actually means to embrace or wrestle, um, which is going to become really important with it. I, I just want to give you a little warning. This is not a sitcom sermon. Okay, there's nothing light about this. We're not going to solve all the problems in 30 minutes. In fact, this message really is to hope, uh, set up Easter and this whole series about where we find hope. But before we talk about hope, we have to talk about the problem. 
And so today we're going to we're going to break down some of the things that Habakkuk had to deal with and and ask some honest question with ourselves. So this is not going to be an easy uh, listen. Uh, this is going to be a tough one, but at a time right now with the coronavirus and everything is happening, uh, I think it's timely because we need to find hope. But you got to dip before you rise. And so that's that's what we're going to do today. There's going to be a lot of brutal honesty here. OK, um, and I know a lot of us are going through it. How many of us might lose our jobs through this? You know, I, I'm talking to my my fellow pastors, you know, some of them, some of their churches may not survive this. Um, some of you have lost jobs or you've been laid off and you're going to go, is there something going to be waiting for me when I get back? Some, some people are, are, um, their marriages are going through a horrible time. Um, an article last week was saying that divorce lawyers, uh, the calls for divorce lawyers in New York city went up 35% in the last couple of weeks. You know, everybody's stuck indoors and all of a sudden they realize they don't want to be married to that person anymore. Maybe you've been someone that's gone through divorce, which is a horrible experience. Maybe um, your health is bad. Maybe you have contracted this virus or you have problems ahead of time. We have many of us who are going through cancer, um, illness, loss, all these kind of things. And, and, you know, you think you got to beat and then something else comes. Life is hard. And, and you know what? A lot of well-meaning Christians will come to us and they'll say things. Well, you know, God is in control. Just let go. Let God, you know, don't let your faith be rattled. You know, don't be spiritually shaken. And uh, those things are well-intentioned, but aren't actually entirely effective and don't really answer the question, do they? Really? I mean, think about the statement, God is in control. And I know what people mean by that. You know, he's sovereign and he's over everything and, and those kind of things. But God doesn't control every detail. He already knows the outcome and he will interject and inter intervenes in history when he chooses to. But everything that happens isn't just because God has made it happen. Okay. Many, many things are, are a consequence of sin and suffering. And for us, the struggle isn't, isn't, you know, is God making it happen? It's why he lets it happen. Why don't you do anything? And that's, that's uh, Habakkuk's first, you know, question. You know, why do you make me look at this injustice? You know, the verse I was reading before. Um, why do you tolerate wrongdoing, destruction, violence are before me? There's strife, conflict abounds. Therefore, the law is paralyzed and justice never prevails. You know, he's looking at his own people and he's saying, this is not good, God. Why don't you do something? You know, if I had to list off uh, Habakkuk's problems with God, they kind of fall into three categories. And maybe you can identify with this. First of all, it seems like God doesn't care. You know, he allows injustice and suffering. Um I remember one time I went on a missions trip to Honduras and it was horrible. We were doing hurricane relief and we were working in this little town and the rainy season was coming. Rainy season was when the hurricane had happened the previous year. And uh, this little town was going to be cut off because the roads were so damaged by the hurricane that they kind of had a makeshift road that you use for a little bit. But as soon as the rains came, there was no way you were going to be able to navigate. It was right on the side of a mountain. And so I remember we finished up, we were building houses and uh, they told me about the children uh, there that every time it rained, they would start crying um, because they felt like the, the hurricane was coming back and uh, they were inconsolable. It was really, really difficult on the parents, you know, as they're trying to comfort their kids through this. And uh, I remember, you know, last time we could watch the rains were coming in like it was just, you could just see these dark clouds approaching. We prayed with them. We said goodbye to these people, not knowing what was going to happen to them. We got on that, got in this pickup and, uh, you know, the, the safety laws for driving in Honduras are a little different. We were sitting in the back of this pickup truck driving along this mountain road with no guardrails, you know, a thousand feet drop off on the side, looking back on that valley and that little town and watching the clouds come in. And I thought, what kind of world do we live in where a child cries every time it rains? You know, and, and those are tough questions. And, you know, it, it took me months to work through that the second thing Habakkuk's observing is, is it doesn't seem like God is doing much when he could we recognize that God is good and all-powerful why doesn't he do something about it why doesn't he do something about suffering and then also what you are doing doesn't seem fair when God acts it seems either inadequate or too much or it seems like he's cheering for the wrong side 
I guess the question is, is it ever okay to question God? And I would always say yes. I, I promote the idea of respectfully um, airing our grievances to God. And, and this is actually biblically precedented in, in the book of Psalms. Over a third of the Psalms are written by people who are hurting, who are wondering where God is and what he's doing. They, they start painfully. And I, 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 I'm not underlying that in any way. They are painful Psalms. Raw, I think is the way one um, Eugene Peterson described the Psalms. They were raw. Um, the authors of Job, Lamentations, Ecclesiastes, Jeremiah, Second Peter, Hebrews, First and Second Thessalonians were all written to people who were filled with doubt and in difficult suffering times. Jesus himself, you know, on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Uh, we all have these times. And you know what? It's okay to ask that question. It really is. We all struggle in our faith. And, and so Habakkuk, and it goes on in chapter 1 and verse 5, it says, Look at the nations and watch, be utterly amazed, for I'm going to do something in your days that you would not believe even if you were told, Habakkuk 1 and 5. So God says to Habakkuk, you know, Habakkuk's complaining about the injustice in his own world. God says, don't worry, I'm going to do something. Um, and this is an interesting um, statement because then he goes on in verse 6, 7 and 9 to say, I'm raising up the Babylonians. They are ruthless and impetuous people who will sweep across the whole earth and seize dwellings not their own. They are feared and dreadful people. They all come intent on violence. And Habakkuk's going, that's your answer to the problem? Our people are disobeying God, so you're going to take worse people and introduce them into the mix? You're actually going to wipe us out? That doesn't seem fair. You know, I guess it's, it brings me to my next point. A committed believer can both wrestle with honest questions and embrace a genuine faith in God. You know, the thing I love about Habakkuk is, is that he's answer, asking questions, but he's asking them to God. He's not turning his back on God. He's asking God. Look at his, the pain in, in Habakkuk's question, verse 12. Lord, are you not from everlasting? My God, my Holy One, you will never die. You, Lord, have appointed them to execute judgment. You, my rock, have ordained them to punish. Your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrongdoing. Why then do you tolerate the treacherous? Why are you silent while the wicked swallow up those more righteous than themselves? Habakkuk is saying, you, you know, we're bad. But these guys are even worse. Like, how, how could you be for this? Three things to remember during this quickly. First, we need to know that God understands your pain. He understands your pain. He did answer Habakkuk's question. It wasn't the answer he wanted. But he did talk about the need to address the injustice and the sin of the people of Judah. The second thing is he welcomes your questions. And God would rather have us express our displeasure at him than walk away from him. This is quite literally a defining moment in Habakkuk's life. And so that brings me to my, my next point. Don't deny your doubts. Let your doubts drive you to God. You know, um, Craig Rochelle writes, what if honestly acknowledging your doubts is the first step towards a building a deeper faith? What if embracing your secret questions opens a door for a maturing knowledge of God's character? What if becoming closer to God, developing genuine intimacy with him, requires you to bear that which feels unbearable, to hear him through the ominous utterance, to trust him in the moment of doom, to embrace his strength when you're weak with a burden? What if it takes real pain to experience deep and abiding hope? Think about that for a minute. What if these darkest, deepest, darkest moments of our lives, the ones where God doesn't make sense, become the ones when our, the depth and meaning and connection and strength of the relationship we have with Christ deepens? I always say um, suffering makes you bitter or better. What if it makes you better? In fact, what if it actually is a wellspring of hope that we need? You know, here we have Habakkuk. His name means to embrace or to wrestle. Well, maybe that's where we begin this week. Here we are in this dark time in history. A pandemic is sweeping the world. People are dying. Maybe this is the time where we need to not only say, why God, but also say, yet, yeah, I'm going to trust you. I believe that Things may get worse before they get better, yet I'm going to trust you. Remember, we're only in chapter one here. 
we're going to go on with the series and, and visit Habakkuk again after Easter weekend. But one of the tragedies of faith is that so many people walk away from God in chapter one because their faith isn't really deep enough for them to wrestle through with God. What I encourage us as a body of Christ to do during these times of darkness and suffering that you may be going through or will go through or have gone through, let's embrace Christ. That doesn't mean we don't question. That doesn't mean we don't say, God, why is this going on? Why can't I, you know, why can't things get better? When is this going to end? When will there be a cure? Maybe this is the time, though, where we go, God, I don't understand, but I'm going to trust you. When I was 15 years old, I went to this conference. Uh, it was it was an amazing conference in London, Ontario. It was a youth conference. And it was at that conference when I was praying on the final night when God, night when God told me I was going to become a pastor. Uh, I received my call from God. It seemed like everybody saw it before I did, but that's the night I knew. I actually originally wanted to be a police officer, but I remember I came home that night. I was very excited and, you know, doing teenager things. I was 15 years old. I gotten the numbers of a couple girls at the conference and, you know, I was going to mail them letters and things like that. Anyways, I got home and my mother was waiting to pick me up, which was unusual because normally I would get a ride with one of the other guy's parents. Um, but she was, she drove me home and my friend home, she dropped my friend who was down the street off instead of pulling in our driveway. And, uh, she dropped him off and then pulled in the driveway. She says, Scott, just a minute. Um, your father died tonight. And my dad and I had kind of been rebuilding a relationship and for two years. My father had become a follower of Jesus Christ when I was 13. And, and uh, it was a volatile but really neat time in my life. And there I was 15 years old and my father had died. He didn't live with us. Uh, he lived apart, but he and I had bonded um, a lot through that. And I was in shock, you know. So I went downstairs. I was going to my bedroom. And... Uh, I went in my bedroom, I knelt down, and I said, God, I don't know why. I don't know what I'm going to do, but I pick you through this. I'm going to trust you through this. That's what I'm encouraging us to do. You don't know how, you don't know why, but you're going to pick God. That's what I'm encouraging us to do. Let's pray. Father, this dark time in our world right now, you have called us to be salt and light. And that doesn't mean we give trite and easy answers. It doesn't mean we act so giddy that everybody is, you know, turned off by the saccharine attitude we have. No, in instead, God, we pray that we would openly ask the questions we have, but at the same time demonstrate faith. Help us to wrestle with this time and to embrace you. God, give us the strength to do that. And God, light a light of hope in our hearts. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for being with us. Walking through the valley again and again, never knowing if the next step is the right one. We carry worries that were never meant to be ours alone. Cares that should be cast on the only one who is able to hold them. We've allowed the very things God designed to raise us up to become the weight that wears us down. We turn blessings into burden and gratitude into grief allowing our fears to drown out the reminders of his goodness towards us. Every moment is now subjected to the worry of another task, another job, another need, because we have forgotten. We have forgotten the name that the mountains must bow to. We have forgotten the one who has seen us through every trial and proven himself faithful. We have forgotten the peace that transcends all understanding. But while we may have forgotten, we can still choose to remember. We can remember that he is the God of every trial and every trial must bow before him. 
the god of the quiet and the chaos, triumphant in the valley, present in the storm, creator of the mundane and the miracle, our ever-present help in trouble. Jesus Christ, the Lord of all. You know, it's times like this um, where we're we're kind of relearning how to do church. A really interesting conversation with some of the local pastors from my denomination. And Good Friday, we're actually going to use uh, Zoom to, to uh, do a service online on Good Friday at 10 o'clock. I'll be sending out details to you uh, what that'll look like. Uh, thank you again, those of you who are sending your tithes and offerings in. Please continue to support Court Community Church. I know some of you are suffering financially right now, um, but I know many of you still have your jobs and things. Continue to support your church. It's my desire that we come out of this stronger, um, that our staff can all come back to their hours and, and uh, that we continue to thrive as a church. One of the beautiful things about KCC is we don't have to pay for our facility when we're not using it. So that's wonderful. And then also as well, we don't owe any money. We have no um, we have no debt. And so let's pray we continue to do that and that God, we, you know, as we weather, weather this. And so thank you. Continue to be generous and please continue to keep touch with us. We're going to be trying to set up some small groups through Zoom and uh, doing some things and having some, uh, some help for people. Um, we have a number of people right now who are asking that if anybody needs anything, they're willing to serve or give. And so if you need something, can you please let us know? Um, there's grocery cards, there's help, there's people that are willing to buy groceries and things, and uh, they're just itching to help somebody out. So if that's you, let me know, and uh, we'll make sure to get some help over to you. This is a church. This is what we do. We take care of each other and we watch out for each other. I also ask you to continue to pray for us. Um, right now, I'm putting a lot of these messages online and working online with a lot of these things. It's quite time consuming, but very rewarding work. And thank you for your wonderful feedback. Um, we're going to be attempting, like I said, different networking things to get us together in the coming months um, as this continues on. Let's hope it doesn't go on too long. But while it does, I, I believe God has some work to do in our hearts and in our church. And so keep in touch. Um, thank you to Doug Schultz. Those prayer requests have been absolutely amazing. If you have a prayer request, go ahead and do that. Um, send it to us. We're, we're happy to pray. Uh, it's awesome. We Our prayer lists are coming out two, three times a week, but the, the prayers are powerful and, and we're seeing life change and we're seeing some wonderful things happen. So continue to stay in touch. And remember, we love for you. We love you. We pray for you by name. And uh, we're going to beat this, folks. And we're going to come out on the other side um, stronger than we went in. So let's continue to do that. Thank you for being with us. God bless you.